Thank you very much. And, oh, I forgot to write down what number we're on, if this is four or five of Israel standing in the faith. And uh, so, well, we'll figure that out. And uh, you know that it's about standing in the faith. And this is uh, the message after the day, I mean, the, the week after Mother's Day. Uh, it also happens to be the time of Pentecost and uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon Israel. Uh, those that were gathered there in the upper room uh, were Israelites. And uh, Paul addresses them, or P, uh, Peter addresses them uh, as such in the book of Acts. Now, my point in bringing that up is, I believe that there is power and a, uh, a strengthening that we can have, and that is available to us, that we would refer to as the power of the Holy Spirit that is to come upon God's people. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, do we not? If we just have our own might and our own power, and we are totally just dependent upon our flesh, we then are of all most men, I would say, miserable. Because it is not through our flesh that we are delivered, but I believe the greater message is the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ is there to deliver us out of our fleshly condition and our fleshly limitations to bring us unto His kingdom. And there are some great verses on this in the scriptures that uh, hopefully we will be able to get into. Uh, But you cannot separate any of these feast days from the kingdom because the kingdom is all about recognizing those feast days as well, celebrating those feast days, understanding what they mean spiritually. We certainly should also understand that every one of those feast days are types and shadows of our Lord Jesus Christ. They they are there to remind us of what He did, what He came to accomplish for us, and that there is a great salvation we have because of what He accomplished for us. He loved us so much that He has given unto us, made the way for us to have a great salvation. Now, when we're having or understanding this aspect of salvation, then we have to also understand the sad, fleshly, fallen condition that we have been in. We have a fallen nature that we inherited from the first Adam. We have a glorious deliverance that is made available to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Amen? And our faith should totally be in what He accomplished for us, that we understand this great salvation that we have, because He is the way, He is the truth, and He is our life. So therefore, we should live and move and have our being within Him. And that means that we should do everything we can to not be a part of this world and this worldly system, but to come out of this worldly system, not be partakers of her sins, and recognize that there is a life, a life that we can have that is much more abundant, that we can have much more freedom and liberty, that is outside of what this world and our flesh offers. And by the way, this again is referred to in the scriptures as kingdom life, kingdom living. When Israel stepped outside of, or when Israel lives outside of her heritage, her biblical heritage, her biblical calling, and this is a a calling that we could also refer to as a family calling of a family gathering. How many of you have been to family uh, reunions? 
Well, that's what Israel is all about. It's a family reunion. It's a family gathering. When we mix that up and we pervert that understanding of what that family gathering is and what it is all about, we can have problems. Can we not? Perhaps you may not understand that. But I want to use an example for you here right off at the beginning of this message. And a minister showed this to me uh, recently and used it as an argument that it's okay to vote in strangers, non-Israelites over us today, to be president of the United States as long as they're Christian. Now, people hearing this may say, well, I I understand that. You know, look at Bush and look at uh, these other ministers out, I mean, these other presidents who are white, but they didn't do us any favors. And we certainly can't really refer to them as Christian. But if we could have a Christian, let's say, Obama, and we understand Obama's really not a Christian, just in name only, But if we could really have a true Christian Obama, would you rather have him over you or would you rather have Bush over you? Now, you have to stop and think about that a little bit here. I know people would, in some cases, rush out and say, oh, I'd rather have Bush in a a heartbeat. And some would rush out and say just the opposite. No, I'd rather have a Christian Obama who's really a Christian. Well, let me make it a little bit more challenging for you. Some people like uh, Alan Keyes. He's a black man. I like Alan Keyes, too. I've gone to hear him speak. I like a lot of his ideas. I, I certainly, in many ways, think he would be better for us than a Bush. I certainly believe he'd be better than this little Obama. No question in my mind on that. But then somebody will ask, well, then what is, does that mean that you would vote for him for president? If you have a list of, I could, I could make a list for, of, of a lot of ungodly white presidents. Could, not, could I not? <laughs> There's a ton of them, right? And then put a one good uh, non-Israelite, alien stranger in that crowd who happens to be a Christian. For instance, let's just say Watchman Nee. Put him in that crowd. How many of you have read the books by Watchman Nee? What a, what a great guy. What a strong Christian, right? Would you have him over you? Would you prefer to have him over you than all these others? Well, you know, that is really a, uh, it's a sad plight when you stop and think about it, that really we've come down to that, that that's our choice. First of all, isn't it a curse? The alien will be over you if you violate God's word. So is it really a blessing having a stranger over you who may be a Christian, who may be a Christian, But really, we've come down to that's our only choice. My my point in this is that if you had such a choice, and obviously we have in America to some degree, to some degree, uh, it's a sign of our captivity. Are you listening? If we're down to that level, if we're down to those choices, it's a sign of our captivity that we should have Israelite-believing, Christian-believing people of our own race. Now, it gets even stranger when you start getting into the aspects of the kingdom because there's some within our movement that believe that the strangers can come into the kingdom, be a part of the kingdom, and that means all people. As long as they're Christian, that's the only caveat. That's the only main qualifications. And so we can have a kingdom mixed up of any and everybody out there that as long as they're Christian. Um, 
God Almighty called Israel to be separate from the beginning. Do you remember that? Certainly, if you read the scriptures, he called them to be separate. Did God make a mistake in calling the nations to be separate? I don't think so. I think he knew exactly what he was talking about. When God Almighty called Israel to separate, when going to the, ki- the kingdom land and cleanse it out, I think he knew what he was talking about. I believe... Well, let me put it this way. I'm not going to. I don't. I don't want. I was going to get into the salvation issue. I don't want to get into off on a, a tangent on that one right now. My point in all of this is, we have to think about what we're asking for when we're when we're getting into some of these deeper aspects of theology, and and it also brings home the the concept and the important. Uh, uh, religious theology about the kingdom and the Israel message, we have to know who we are. We have to know what God's law says about it. God's word says about this subject. We have to be thoroughly knowledgeable and studied in this area, or we can be deceived and can be actually instruments of our own demise. By bringing innocent-sounding pollutants into our theology, into the kingdom here, and actually corrupting the kingdom. Obviously, nobody wants to corrupt the kingdom and have a corrupt kingdom understanding, right? I don't. But there are some that say, we can have all these various strangers in. And, that, and they say, that's how it will be when Jesus comes again. The kingdom, let's just say, it starts here in the United States of America, as an example. This is the land of the kingdom that it starts out with. I believe the scriptures are very clear. It starts out in some area and grows. The scriptures say that Israel is to be a light into all the families of the earth, right? How many of you believe that? I do believe that. But the question is, in what way are we to be a light? Obviously, by loving the Lord Jesus Christ, pursuing the right, true, biblically founded principles of the kingdom. Not by doing things according to what they think is biblically correct, obviously. That will destroy us. Not by trying to be multiculturalized. That will destroy us. Will it not as well? Do we not have to therefore respect that there is a kind after kind principle and also that that if you bring this mixed multiculturalized society in into being and call that the kingdom, what will result from that? Could that bring about perversions? I think that it, I think that it most certainly can and will. And we are warned of this because we have biblical precedent, again, that establishes these principles. Now, why am I bringing this up again? I'm bringing this up because, obviously, there are certain leaders, ministers within our, quote, movement, that are good, kind, loving, Christian, Bible-believing people. I'm not, this, I'm not doing away with that. I'm not here to tear them down. They honestly believe what they believe. But... We're going to have to be very, very careful in this because if that's the way they do believe and they're going to push that belief, what is that going to do to the truth? What is that going to do when we're looking at the kingdom and our vision and view of the kingdom? Might this be a concern for all of us in some way? I believe that that it should be and ought to be a concern because we need to get this right. Is it an emotional issue? Yeah, it is an emotional issue. Is it, a, is it an issue that there is great concern and debate upon? Yes, it is. But if you believe that that is the way for the kingdom, then you're going to push that. And I believe that that is the wrong way to go. 
Are you saying that, Pastor, because you're a hate monger? No, I'm not saying it because I'm a hate monger. I honestly do not hate any of the other races. Not in a not in a not in a biblical sense. Uh, boy, that that would be a sermon in and of itself. Let me tell you, when you really get into what is hate biblically, and and what's the worldly definition of it, and all that as, different aspects of it. But I believe it's showing proper biblical love. I I believe it is showing true justice. I believe that it that it will enable higher forms of freedom and liberty than we have ever known before by following the true kingdom biblical pattern. Whatever it is, we need to understand it, we need to pursue it, and it will open up light and truth. What are you saying, Pastor? I believe that if the kingdom, and the kingdom, real kingdom living has not had its day. You hear that from a lot of people. Well, Christians have had their day and they failed. Well, in one aspect, I can kind of understand where they're coming from, but we really have not had true kingdom living, true true biblical kingdom living, where we've applied God's law and really lived by those principles. Certainly not in America. From the very founding of our nation, we blew it on many, many, in many, many ways. What do we have today as an example? Just want to prove my point a little bit here. I don't want to get too far off track. What do we have today? We have the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto over us operating in full function today. We do. We do. What should we have? We should have the 10 commandments. Should we not? There should be no question whatsoever. We should be operating by the Ten Commandments and all the principles and aspects of that. It's not just, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and we stop our thinking. Well, that applies to a lot of different areas here. And we got to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all mind and all soul. We got to obey our, we got to love our parents. We shouldn't lie, we shouldn't cheat, we shouldn't steal. Therefore, there goes the Ten Commandments. I mean, there goes the, not the Ten Commandments, but the, uh, the IRS. The IRS is on the topic, main topic in the nation this past week or so, right? And, but here's an interesting aspect that you won't hear one of these congressmen bring up. That the IRS is not a violation of the Ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. The second plank of the Communist Manifesto is the IRS. It's what the IRS operates on. That tax system is described in the, within the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. What are we operating under today? Communism. Now, again, how many people are really aware of that aspect and that deception and that corruption that we are operating under today? Not very many. And I'm telling you this because there's a corruption within the kingdom understanding. And I'm saying that if we are, are operating under true biblical law, the principles of God's word, which is the kingdom message, if we're really operating under that, we would have high degree of liberty, high degree of freedom. And we would be a light, and I'm cutting this kind of short, we would truly be a light to all the families of the earth and they would be benefiting from this. If we go and live like the other nations and we adopt their ways and we allow all these other gods to come in and all these other corruptions and forms of 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 nation law building not biblical law building but nation law building if we allow all that to come into our nation as we have today in the United Nations whole theory and philosophy that we're operating under if we allow that 
we are not going to be a light, but a darkness, and we're not going to be able to help the other nations. What is what what does this national one world government operate under today? Globalism, whole idealism. It's operating on the love of money and the money that they can use to manipulate and control all the other nations out there, which is slavery, which is what we are operating under today. They're controlling us through the, the manipulation of the money system. That's why they have to have this tax system, because it is the force that they use to control and keep you in line with what these money changers are demanding. They're the ones that are creating all these policies. They're the ones that are behind this health plan, which is a communistic health plan. A commun- it, is, it, is, it is invoking more communism. And that's what the door is open to. Not for more freedom and liberty, but more communism. We are becoming more and more of a communist society, a communistic nation. And, 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 and the way that we are going about uh, the development and the road that we're going down as a nation and as a people today. Real quickly, George. Under the guise of democracy. Under the demo- uh, guise of democracy. Yes, absolutely. So there's a lot to this that's going on that opens up lots of, lots of different um, trains of thought. And we have to get our thoughts in line properly. And the way that we do this basically is to keep our, li- our, our thoughts in line with the Word of God. You can get off track so easy out there, folks, if you do not stay in alignment our minds and our hearts in alignment with God's Word. And that's where we're called to go. That's what we're called to do. And believe it or not, who we are has a lot to do with setting the record straight as well. Certainly, first and foremost, it's knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, that He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's God Almighty. He's the sovereign. And we have to align ourselves according to His will and bless Him. He's given us His word to set a lot of this stuff straight, to get our understanding straightened out. And But how many Christians are utilizing that? Most of what we see as far as that is referred to as Christianity today, it's really Judeo-Christianity, is doing away with God's law, replacing it with grace. And that's a warped understanding of the Scripture. But we have to understand who we are. We have to understand the Israel message. Why might that be important? Because for one thing, if you don't know who you are, then you're going to be sucked into the understanding that some other group of people, mostly known as the Jews, are God's chosen people. But what is their Bible? It's the Babylonian Talmud. Now, we all know that. I'm preaching to the choir, I understand that. But nevertheless, it needs to be repeated here. The Jews are not Christian. They have a different philosophy. They have a different religion, and it is Antichrist. But if you don't know who you are, and, you're, and you believe that the Jews are God's chosen people, you're going to lift them up. You're going to praise them. You're going to promote them and their and who they are even beyond what their beliefs are. It doesn't matter what they will tell you. They're God's chosen people. Why, everybody knows they will say the Jews are God's chosen people. Don't you dare even question that. And therefore, you don't even question their Antichrist beliefs. You don't, you don't question their Antichrist philosophy. You don't question the fact that they're in control of Hollywood, that they're in control of our money system, that they're controlling mo- most of our uh, newspapers and magazines and media today in a lot of different ways. Don't look beyond. Don't think too hard. Don't co- d- if you come to understand that the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, Kindred people are the true Israelites, and you understand that Christianity came from uh, this race, the Caucasian people, who are Adamites, all the way up through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
Isaac, the sons of Isaac, and that we have a a strong Israelite history here that they don't want us to know, don't want us to understand, and that the outpouring of Christianity mainly came from, even with all their perfections, the, the white Caucasian people, even with all, all their imperfections, Christianity did come from them. The, the, uh, the religion of the West has mainly been Christendom, Christianity. The Bible came from these people. What we are told today, though, is the Bible came from the Jews. No, the Babylonian Talmud came from the Jews, not our Bible. But weren't Jews used in transcribing the Bible? Yeah, we did have Jews that were involved in transcribing aspects of the Bible. But you have to get into the whole aspect of the Word of God. You have to look at the very nature and the marks of Christianity that are promised from the Word of God, that are given to us from the Word of God. Now listen to me. Who funded, who was behind the Bible that we have? They were Christian societies. Yes, even ancient Christian societies that funded these things. Ancient Christian societies, Christian groups brought us the Christian Bible. It was the white Caucasian people who brought us the Christian Bible. And they used learned scholars. Now, there is an ancient form of Catholic Catholicism that is prior, are you listening? Prior to the corrupt Vatican Catholic Church that we have today. These people are not even hardly talked about, but they were what? They were the ancient Christians, I'm referring to them as, the the first Christians who were involved in giving us the Bible. Now, I'm taking you a little bit here in baby steps because I want to get our, our, our thinking straightened out on this. Is that okay with you? Or if it is or not, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> who wrote the book of Romans? Israelite. Benjamin, Paul was a Benjaminite, an Israelite. Who wrote the book of Peter? First and second Peter. Peter, an Israelite. What do these people come along today and tell us of them, the Judeo-Christian people? They say, well, they're Jews. No, they're Israelites. Do you, are you listening to me? A Jew did not give us the book of Peter. A, a, a Jew did not write the book of Matthew, John, Luke, Mark, etc. These were written by our race, our racial kinsmen, Israelites, according to the flesh. That aspect and that history, and it's carried on down the line, even to, like I'm saying, carried on to the ancient forms of Catholicism of our racial kinsmen who were of the early day Christian churches that were, that were there in Ephesus, the, the church of Corinth, right? Are you following me? All these uh, uh, areas that the, uh, uh, the, our disciples, the, the, uh, the apostles went through and established the first Christian churches. These are the people that brought us the word of God that has been covered up and hidden. And again, if we don't know our history, then we will believe a lie and attribute the goodness of God's word in his kingdom to these false antichrist people. 
And we must not make that mistake. And so it is important that we know our Christian biblical identity. The the Christian gospel is not the gospel of the Jew. Jesus was not a Jew. Was he? Jesus was a Judean from the tribe of Judah. There's a big difference there. A big, big difference. Because the people who refer to themselves as Jews today are Canaanites, Edomites, and a Khazar, Khazarian mixture of people who mainly have a Turkish-Mongolian background. These people were also of the enemies of Israel long ago that got swallowed up in the Babylonian Empire, and they are the ones that came up with the Babylonian Talmud. And that is their Bible. It is a vile Antichrist Bible. Unbiblical Bible. All right. But we've got to understand that we have Israel. I'm speaking to you, the Caucasian Israelites, the white people, the Adamic people, the Abrahamic people, the Hebraic people. I'm speaking to you because you are the Israelites and it matters who you are. Well, I don't see it in the world today. I see everybody praising the Jews. Yeah, you see the world doing all kinds of ungodly, corrupt things and believe all kinds of ungodly, corrupt things. Is that what you're going to do today? You're going to follow what the masses are doing and that's going to be your Christian gospel according to the masses and what they're doing. I hope not. I love it. I did watch uh, the Glenn Beck program this past week. One of them, he had three ministers on at the end. He was talking about abortion, and he did a great job on that. And one of them was a black minister, and I give him credit for it because Glenn Beck was kind of asking about the idea of, of the masses and numbers. And we don't really have the numbers, and a lot of people like to follow the numbers. And the black minister spoke up and he said, God bless him for this. He said, you notice that Jesus didn't have the numbers with him, basically is what he was saying. Even at the end, they wouldn't even follow him. And Glenn Beck was sitting there, yeah, you got a point there. So for even for, like I've said before, my message is, if we're looking at the numbers, Jesus should have had thousands upon thousands upon thousands there. And they should have surrounded the uh, Jewish high priest and and Pilate and all those guys there and says, no, sir, you're not getting them. But that wasn't the way that it was. Most people cannot handle truth. And that's what Jesus came to tell them. And he told them that. You can't even handle the truth. But we've got to get back, though, to the basics. God called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he made an eternal, everlasting covenant with them. And he said to them basically this, Israel, if you'll obey my commandments, if you will keep my word, you will be a light unto the nations. But I've called you out of the world to be my own, to separate yourselves unto me, to obey my commandments, to establish the kingdom, order, And if you will do this, Israel, you will be a light unto the other nations out there. Now let me stop there. I'm not even going to ask how many believe this, but you think to yourself, do you really believe that? Because that is a powerful, powerful truth. Do you know the kingdom message that well? Are you that familiar with it? Should we not have faith in the true gospel kingdom calling that we have? And it is a family calling. He didn't call us to be mixed. He called us to be separate unto him. And in this, in this calling that I've just described for you there, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Call me weird, call me strange. 
I believe that. I'm gullible enough to believe God's word. I'm gullible enough to believe that he did not make a mistake in that calling, in that Israelite calling. And so when Israel steps outside of this family calling and she mixes herself and blends herself racially, religious, or nationally, we we lose our ethnic heritage and we lose our our kingdom purpose. You see, you people didn't know maybe that you were really going to school today and that's what's happening. Welcome to welcome to um, uh, Kingdom Ethics 101 maybe or maybe even beyond that. The kingdom of God is not a rainbow coalition. I want you to turn, please, in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, 89, Psalms 89, verse 1, quote, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. How many of you think you could sing that long? (laughs) Just a little joke. It means, boy, that you will be, it's within your heart. There's a melody of the kingdom, right? With my mouth, I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. God's given you a mouth, Israel, and he expects you to use it. And what is David? I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Here's the big question. Has God been faithful to Israel? Has God been faithful to Israel? You know, he has his people still all throughout the world in various places. I was, my heart kind of uh, jumped with excitement when I was hearing that uh, uh, Pastor Charles Jennings was in South Africa. And he's preaching to a uh, Pentecostal church there of Israel believers. And I was very excited about that. To me, that's true biblical missionary work. Oh, no, Pastor, we want to go out there and we want to straighten up all the other races. Well, if God's called you, my answer to that would be, by all means, go. But you better be very, very careful and make sure that's what God has called you to do. Really, in my mind, there's no doubt that God's called me into Israel to mainly preach the gospel message. Now, if others come in that want to hear the Israel message, praise God for it. But... Our main calling is unto our brethren. Because what? Judgment comes to the house of God first. That's what the scriptures teach. Israel, therefore, has to get their act together, cannot be a blessing, cannot straighten anybody out, unless they get their own act together first. And then how God Almighty is going to use Israel after that to bring correction to the rest of the world, I don't know, but that's, it's not up to me. I just, when and how he wants to handle that, great. It's like when I've said before, when I get into the kingdom, I'm sure I'm going to find out, wow, there are some things that you didn't know. And I'm not going to fight against God's plan. I'm going to say, well, what is the plan? Let's get in there. Let's get with it. Aren't you? So, um, verse 2, For I have said, and... Boy, when I read this one over, it was just, um, boy, it just kind of loud blasts of the trumpet sound to me. Uh, It's all I can, the only way I can describe it. Here's what it says. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Wow. So think about that. What did the Judeo-Christians world teach? Hell shall be built up forever. God's eternal wrath and judgment shall be built up forever. No. 
What it says here is, God's mercy shall be built up forever. I don't know about you guys, but I'm happy for that. I, I need His mercy. We all, I don't care who you are, you need His mercy, do you not? And we, you better be thankful that that's the true gospel. But I don't know. When I was in the Judeo-Christian world, I heard mainly God's wrath is there forever. Not that His mercy was there forever. That's love. Do you understand that? That is biblical love. But where are we... T- yeah, we're, we're not told, told this in the Judeo-Christian world for the most part. Oh, yeah, they have their ceremonies, they have their big churches, they have their doctrines, and oh, they have their love one for another. And they're, all, they're very multicultural. They love it when you can bring in uh, a, a uh, black man and a white woman with a mulatto child. Why are you bringing that out, Pastor? You're just throwing a monkey wrench in this, you know? You're kind of ruining it. No, that's the way it is. It is. I remember this past week, and I should have brought the, the paper where I got it in my office. It's a black young man with a white woman having a baby, and they're asking funds for it because the baby's having some, some uh, uh, medical problems. But he's smiling, and he's got his arm around her, and they're smiling. And I think, you know, um, just on the surface principle of this, the Judeo-Christian world loves it. They would look at them as, oh, what a bright, wonderful, a shining example of Christianity here. Is it? Should we be happy and pleased and think it's a wonderful thing that our people are intermarrying with the other people out there or vice versa? Should we think that's a great thing? But would not and do not Judeo-Christian people think that? And because of what I'm saying and what you guys believe, and those of you uh, watching this DVD, what would the world think? They would think you are a bad, wicked, terrible hate monger, right? That they really love. They have the gospel of love. Well, I'm coming along telling you God's mercy endures forever when you really understand it. That this false barbecue pit of eternal damnation is not really taught in the scriptures, but is taught through the Judeo-Christian church. But I'm the hate monger. They have love. They they just love, love, love. I don't know how to straighten the problem out. All I do know for a fact is God's called me to preach the word and to preach the truth and to do it with boldness and stand in faith. And I'm going to do that. I can't solve all the world's problems. Sorry, I'm not God. If I could, if I could uh, say the right words or do certain things to make it possible, I would do it if God gave me the, the ability. But this I do know. And I do promise you from God's word that this creation shall be delivered from its bondage into the glorious liberty of the children or sons of God. That's going to happen in God's timing. That's what the kingdom is all about. Do you understand that? There is a great work ahead of us, a blessed, glorious work of restoration that's going to come about in the kingdom. I look forward to that. So, Yeah, what we see right now, you really have to stand in faith. Oh, but poor, I mean, uh, good old Abraham, he didn't have to go through those struggles. It was so easy for him. He just had faith, see? No, read it. It says even his father was involved in paganism and idolatry. His family, most of the families of Adam were involved in idolatry. Abraham was a rarity. How many families have to put up with that? I was talking to a uh, someone this past week, and there is that division in the family, and it was it's very troublesome when you have your your children or your family that are divided. But that's how it is many many times. Uh, 
What would y'all think of me if, if I had a, a family divided and I said, you know, I love y'all very much and I love Jesus, but I don't want to lose any of my family, and so I'm going to go join them. You know, I want to be where they're at spiritually or where they're at in the world. Maybe they're not even spiritual or not. They just don't love church anymore because there's too many hypocrites, or they don't understand God's word, or it's too demanding. You know, I don't want to... They, it, God demands righteousness. I want to do my own thing. The heck with what God's word says. If it feels good to me, I want to do that. I have no standard of righteousness, and that's what I want to do. And so, you know, people, I love my family. I want to go be with them, and I'm going to do that. Do you respect me? Well, I wouldn't be able to respect myself. And I know one thing, I learned the message under men of God, like J.V. and others, and Pastor Sheldon Emery, that's not the type of men they were. They stood strong for the gospel of Christ. They may have had some things wrong theologically, but they stood strong for Jesus Christ and His kingdom and the Word of God. That's what we are to do. We are to stand strong in the faith. Quit ye like men, the Bible says. Stand strong in the faith. Wouldn't you to, wouldn't you to God that we had presidents and congressmen living like that today? Yes, that they were solidly and holy Christian. You could count on that. You don't have to wonder, well, I wonder what they're going to be today. I wonder what they're going to do. I wonder what principles they're going to stand on. I don't have to worry about that because I know that man and that woman's a Christian and they're going to stand on the principles of God's Word. But they're going to be made fun of by the world. I don't care because I know they're going to stand on God's Word. That's what we need. That's what's going to bring about kingdom resolve, kingdom correction. So does my heart and should your heart not yearn for the kingdom to come? Yeah. Let's keep reading here. Verse 3, back in uh, Psalm 89, verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen. Well, okay, who's his chosen? Well, we've already gone over that. But it obviously is important that he's made a covenant with his chosen. But we want to come along today and say, you know, it's so confused, it's so mixed up. This group says that, and this Baptist church says this, and this Presbyterian, and this Catholic group over here, and this Jewish group over here, and this Muslim Islamic group says this, and, and this, uh, the, the Buddhists say this, and blah, 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 and I, oh, the world says this, and the president says this. I don't know what to think anymore, Pastor. Well, get your head out of the sand and get your head into God's Word. How much better off we would be if we really just started reading and believing God's word? I made a covenant with my chosen. Well, then that's important. And how dare people come along to say, the covenant's not important anymore. Have you noticed that they're the very same people that come along and say, God's law is not important anymore? Oh, God's law is not important. Yes, if you actually do away with the law, the covenant is void. Because isn't that what the new covenant says? I'm going to write my laws upon their heart. He doesn't say, I'm going to do away with my law completely because that's been the problem all along. No, he says, I'm going to write my laws upon the hearts of Israel. Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 10. With, with Judah and Israel, meaning they were a divided kingdom. So, take heart in this. I have made covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever. Is this seed still established today? Yes, it is. Even in its sad condition, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, kindred people, the people of Christendom, it's still here today. 
It's in sad shape. And it's full. We have, we have the problem that Israel is listening to terrorists today. And it's tearing them down, right? Okay. Uh, let's look on to verse 5. And the, and the heaven shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Who are the congregation of the saints? Here's some homework for you, Israelites. Look up saints. Go to the Old Testament, look it up. Because we're in the Old Testament here. Everywhere you look, the term saints says and means and applies to Israel. Here's here's another verse real quick. I'll read it for you. Psalms 11, 3, we're all familiar with it. It says this, quote, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We've read that many, many times. I don't know how, uh, how seriously some of you are thinking about it, but it's very important to the kingdom covenant understanding. If we do away with that foundation and we pervert it and we say, you know, it isn't going to hurt. God isn't going to miss it. I'm just going to pick the who Israel is out of the equation here and we'll put it over here in a box somewhere and hide it away. And that isn't going to affect the foundation. Well, you're a fool. The foundation of Christianity is on shaky ground today in a strong major way because that's been removed from the equation and they've replaced it with this with this Jewish mortar. And the foundation is faulty now. And that foundation is going to crack. And you know what? I'm just going to stand back and get out of the way of that foundation that's faulty that's built upon the sinking sands of, of, of a lie, and I'm going to let that foundation fall. I'm going to let it sink. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand ready in the faith when God calls me and prepares me to go forward and the other sons of God out there, we're going to build the right foundation. Christ in Him crucified and all the whole gospel that goes with it. We're not just going to put in grace and leave the law out. R.J. Rush Dooney, many of you are aware of him, that wrote great books on God's law. He said this, quote, Man does not establish authority, he acknowledges it. Amen. What an important, if you stop and think about it, let me read it again to you. Man does not establish authority, he acknowledges it. Now again, you have to stop and think about that. True authority is not of man, it's of God and His Word. Right? Man does not establish authority, he acknowledges it. And what's he doing? He's speaking of Christ and His kingdom. Well, if we have that kind of a foundation, folks, wow, what a difference that will make. Now, my time is uh, pretty much up this morning. We're going to be getting into some uh, new aspects of this. But is this helping these teachings? Is that helping you, giving you a deeper understanding of the kingdom of God and His righteousness? I hope and pray that it does. Folks, it is the truth. Hang on to it. Be prepared. Seriously. I don't think a lot of times we think about this, that God's given us His truth to prepare us for great kingdom work ahead. When and how, I don't know. But I know it's coming. And I know that He is coming. Let's all stand. We'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank You and we praise You for Your Word. We thank You for... uh, your kingdom, and that we are to seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, 
And all these things will be added unto you. So the problem is we haven't been doing that. We don't believe it for many Christians. They don't believe it because they are not taught anything about the kingdom of God. What they are taught today is to escape into heaven and get in heaven and swing around the pearly gates, strumming our hearts or something like that, not understanding the our kingdom duties, our kingdom responsibilities, nor the amazing glories of the kingdom that are going to come and spread and cover this whole earth, and the heavens shall light up. The heavens will sing forth the amazing things of the kingdom. We look forward to that day. Father, we just want to right now pray for this food that we're going to be partaking of. We ask your blessing upon it to the nourish of our bodies. And thank you for this time that we can have together as Christians in fellowship in kingdom purpose. Amen and amen.